Okay, uh, first of all, a few words about uh, James. Um, I consider myself very lucky uh, to have worked with James throughout his graduate studies because of who he is and what he can do. Uh, in terms of the former, uh, his maturity is beyond his age and so much so that I can always approach him like a colleague instead of a student. And um, he is very conscientious, very independent, very reliable, incredibly efficient, and it would be an understatement to say punctual because he does everything well ahead of time. Uh, as for what he can do, uh, from the title of his dissertation, you can already see that uh, he's working on a very, very challenging problem. Uh, autonomous driving on the road is already very difficult. And autonomous driving off-road on deformable terrains with awareness of and adaptation to the terrain is even more difficult. But as you'll see, uh, James took on that challenge and from modeling to estimation and control and from simulations to experiments, he didn't leave any aspect of the problem untouched. And uh, so it is no surprise that uh, the extreme vehicle dynamics group at the Toyota Research Institute could not wait to add his talent to their team. And we had to move his graduation date up by four months. And only a person like James could pull that accelerated timeline off. And that brings us to today. And James uh, will now share some of the knowledge he gained during his studies with us. And you can find uh, much more uh, in his dissertation. But before he starts, um, a few administrative remarks. Um, if, if you have any clarifying questions uh, while James is presenting, feel free to uh, ask them uh, immediately uh, so that we don't lose you. Um, but if you have questions that require um, further in-depth discussions, uh, I suggest we save them until after the presentation and we will have uh, plenty of time uh, to do a deep dive uh, after James is done uh, presenting. And uh, the floor is open uh, to questions from uh, the, the committee as well as the general audience. So anybody uh, who wants to ask questions during that time, they will be welcome to do so. And then, uh, Around 3.30, I will close all those discussions if they are not over yet, so that uh, the committee has time uh, to discuss with James uh, in private. Um, my intention is to uh, put the committee and James into a breakout room uh, so that the general audience can stay, still stay uh, in this uh, link if they want to stay around and hopefully congratulate James uh, after the committee makes the decision. Um, so you don't need to uh, sign out. Uh, please feel free to uh, stay around uh, even uh, when the committee is deliberating uh, in private. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to James and I look forward to his presentation. All right, thank you, Tolga. Um, you can still see my slides, correct? Correct. Yes, we can. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, first off, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present some of my work and for taking the time to attend this presentation. Um, as Tolga mentioned, I'm James Dallas, and today my talk is going to be on terrain-aware autonomous navigation. Now, an application of autonomous vehicles that's drawn significant interest is in military settings where we can remove human operators from dangerous environments. However, autonomous vehicles have not yet really reached a level of maturity that we can actually apply them in these settings. And the reason for this is that since these military vehicles are often required to operate on off-road deformable terrains, so too must their autonomous counterparts. However, these vehicles are currently limited in application because planners don't adequately represent this tire terrain interaction 
despite the fact that it significantly impacts the vehicle response, it can even actually lead to complete immobilization. Furthermore, not only do we need to account for the tire turns impact on this vehicle response, but in the off-road domain, we often don't even know the terrain properties which characterize this interaction due to the wide variety of trains that can be encountered in the world. Hence, to realize autonomous vehicles in this domain, we must be able to learn and adapt to these terrain conditions in real time. In fact, in the past year, DARPA released a new $30 million program called RACER to address this. And what they identified is that military autonomous vehicles lack the speed and resiliency to be operationally relevant or support battlefield operational tempo. And therefore, the goal of the program is to develop and demonstrate new autonomy technologies that enable ground combat vehicles to maneuver in unstructured off-road terrain at speed. Well, what does at speed mean? You might be thinking of maybe like highway settings or even a racing application. And in fact, an M Razor can actually go about 25 meters per second on road. But for phase one of this program, at speed means just five meters per second. And this highlights a significant challenge in operating these autonomous vehicles in this off-road domain where you can actually experience high slips even at just five to 10 meters per second. Given these issues, the overarching challenge of this thesis is how to maximize autonomous mobility on uncertain deformable terrains. And in achieving this goal, there's four major research areas that are important. And these are trajectory planning, terrain mechanics modeling, terrain estimation, and terrain adaptive planning. However, in the context of these off-road deformable terrains, these are all still open research areas, as I'll discuss next. The first area we'll look at today is trajectory planning. And in particular, the focus of this work is on model predictive control, as it's already demonstrated success in trajectory planning and on-road obstacle avoidance algorithms, and it can account for the safety constraints, the vehicle's handling limits, and predict the future response of the vehicle to determine the actions that should be taken at the present moment. Now, with regards to trajectory planning and obstacle avoidance, both two-level and one-level MPC architectures have been proposed. In a two-level architecture, the problem of path planning and path tracking are decoupled, such that a path planner generates a reference path that a path tracker then seeks to follow. However, by decoupling these planning and tracking algorithms, and without complete knowledge of the vehicle's dynamic limits, the planner can actually generate reference paths that the path or that the vehicle will not be able to follow, no matter how sophisticated these path trackers may be. Furthermore, if you end up deviating from that reference path, or if new information about the environment becomes known, it may actually be beneficial to replan a new path. Therefore, to address these limitations, advanced one-level control techniques have been developed to simultaneously solve that planning and tracking algorithm, and these can incorporate the vehicle's safety requirements and the vehicle's nonlinear dynamics. Because of this, these one-level controllers are better suited for the application of this thesis and are therefore going to be the focus of this work. Single-level MPC architectures have already demonstrated success for on-road obstacle avoidance in unstructured environments. And what I mean by unstructured environments is that these are environments where there's no road or traffic rules to obey. And as you can imagine, in military settings, these kind of environments are of particular interest. And in considering obstacle avoidance in such an environment, it was already demonstrated that MPC can successfully navigate obstacle fields of varying complexity. However, the current state of the art is primarily concerned with rigid terrains and is already quite computationally demanding with computation times around 100 to 200 milliseconds. And hence, it's unknown how it will perform in these off-road deformable terrains. Therefore, while the references shown have demonstrated success for their intended applications, two limitations arise when you consider the focus of this thesis. First, these works assume that the terrain conditions are known, such as a coefficient of friction. However, that's not actually the case in these off-road environments. And second, these references assume rigid terrains and hits do not account for terrain deformability. And this research will address these limitations. In addressing these limitations, it's important to extend these algorithms to account for terrain deformability. And one way that you can do this is through deformable terrain terrain mechanics modeling. Now, terrain mechanics models can be divided into three general categories. 
empirical methods are the simplest. Um, and those are usually used more for the like go or no-go scenarios, but they don't really generalize well beyond their experimental conditions. Physics-based models, on the other hand, are expected to be the highest fidelity, but their large computational effort renders them infeasible for real-time application. And finally, semi-empirical methods kind of strike a balance between these two by combining experimental and analytical methods. And because of this, these models have emerged as the most commonly used Terra mechanics models for application. And the large majority of these are based on the work of Becker and Wong. Essentially, what Becker's method determined was the relationship between terrain parameters and the deformations in the terrain. Then, once you know the stress distribution, you can obtain your forces by integrating these stresses over that contact patch. However, in determining that shear deformation, these methods typically assume the tire is operating in steady state conditions. Addressing that limitation, the soil contact model essentially discretizes that interaction and calculates the stresses at each one of these nodes. And by doing so, that assumption of steady state operation conditions can be relaxed. And we can also extend this to more general three-dimensional shapes, for example, accounting for lugs on a wheel. However, by discretizing that interaction, as you can imagine, the accuracy of this algorithm becomes dependent on how fine we create that mesh, hence causing SCM to lose its ability for real-time application. Furthermore, um, NATO AVT248 actually tested various Terra mechanics models, um, ranging from complex models, such as finite or discrete elements, and even that soil contact model. And they tested these across nine different tests um, from things like a cornering or a double lane change. And what they found was that SCM actually consistently ranked as the top performer. And as such, in this work, we're gonna be using SCM as the ground truth, but it's just too computationally expensive to use for real-time application. In summary, while these existing Terra mechanics models have demonstrated success, state-of-the-art models are limited to one of the following limitations. First, these often assume that the tire is operating in steady state conditions. And second, these existing methods are still relatively computationally expensive, limiting real-time application. And this research will address these issues. Now, as I kind of mentioned already, and as you might have been able to see, those Terra mechanics models depend on many terrain parameters that we don't actually know a priori. And as such, terrain estimation becomes important. And researchers have already recognized this need and have began estimating these Becker terrain parameters. Um, as an example, Galena utilized MCMC for an offline determination, trending towards online. Hutanga Bodhi utilized generalized newton raphson method that was based upon force measurements. And finally, achieving online estimation, um, Yagnema essentially linearized that tire terrain interaction and applied a linear least squares estimator. And while those mentioned works are promising, these methods are still subject to a couple of limitations that arise in these military applications. First, existing methods often rely on force and torque and sinkage um, sensors, which aren't actually standard on these AGVs. Second, these methods assume the tire is operating at low speed and steady state conditions. And finally, those linear approximations have actually been shown to induce quite large errors in the stress distribution and hence in the forces. And this research is going to address these limitations such that these autonomous ground vehicles can better realize their full operating range. Now, finally, you can take that terrain estimator and combine it with the trajectory planner to achieve terrain adaptive planning. And some researchers have already recognized the potential of this, and you can find a limited number of works in the literature. Um, so far, the majority of work has primarily focused on on-road applications, um, you can think of estimating the coefficient of friction, but those works typically rely on linearized vehicle models and a decoupled algorithm. In the off-road domain, terrain adaptation has primarily been concerned with assessing the traversability of terrains based on their slope or their roughness and using that to classify regions as definitely not traversable or areas that can be traversed. However, that work is primarily considered with low-speed rover navigation and hence uses a two-level architecture that does not consider explicitly learning these terrain properties and incorporating those parameters effect on the vehicle response for improved prediction capability. As such, several limitations arise. First, these off-road adaptive techniques 
were developed for low speed rover application and hence do not consider the controller design necessary for these high speed military applications. Second, this literature focuses on assessing terrain traversability and does not explicitly learn these terrain parameters and incorporate their effect on future predictions. And finally, when you combine that computational expense of the one level MPC with the complexity of these deformable terrains, you end up creating a very challenging optimization problem that poses issues in real-time implementation. And this research will address these limitations. In summary, the current state of the art faces the following significant limitations. Terra mechanics models are often um, limited to steady state conditions or computationally intensive and often lack twice continuous differentiability. Terrain estimation algorithms often rely on specialized sensors that aren't actually standard on these vehicles and they're more focused on low speed and steady state conditions. And finally, off-road planning and control algorithms are primarily concerned with rigid terrains in linear and low speed domains, and they don't usually account for the dynamics, optimality, or the terrain parameters impact on the vehicle response. Therefore, the overarching goal of this thesis is to develop a terrain adaptive trajectory planner and controller to maneuver with maximum mobility on deformable terrains. And to achieve this, first, a new terra mechanics model is needed. That terra mechanics model can then be used by the terrain estimator to try to learn these terrain conditions. Then you can combine those two with the vehicle dynamics to achieve terrain adaptive model predictive control. In the original contributions achieved in this thesis that are going to enable that goal are the development of an efficient, dynamic, and twice continuously differentiable deformable terrain terra mechanics model the development of a terrain estimation algorithm capable of real-time performance, the development of a single level terrain adaptive trajectory planning and tracking algorithm for off-road autonomous vehicles operating on deformable terrains, and finally, the development of uncertainty-based contingent MPC, which is a noble selectively robust MPC formulation to increase the robustness to terrain estimate uncertainty. And these contributions are documented in detail in my dissertation, um, where chapter two focuses on Terra mechanics modeling and develops two new Terra mechanics models. Chapter three looks into terrain estimation and develops a real-time terrain estimator and also performs a parameter identification study and shows that we can estimate um, this or we can estimate the identifiable subset. And chapter four looks into that terrain adaptive MPC algorithm, with chapter five extending that to achieve um, additional robustness through uncertainty-based contingent MPC. And in chapter six, there's experimental validation. And in the appendices, there's some alternative formulations and also further on-road experimental validation. Um, in the interest of time, today I'm only going to focus on that neural network terra mechanics model, the development of the terrain estimator, and those two MPC algorithms. However, if you are interested, um, you can find much more detail in my dissertation. Now, with an overview of that motivation and scope given, we'll now discuss some of these research questions in greater detail. And the first question we will address is, can a dynamic, accurate, efficient, and twice continuously differentiable Terra mechanics model be achieved? And to answer this, this work developed um, an SCM simulation single wheel testbed based upon experimental setups that you'll find in the literature. And what this testbed allows for is for individual control of all of the inputs of the tire, such as the load, its rotation, and its velocities. And from that, you can extract the impact of each of these inputs on that force. And hence, you can extend these Becker models through a series of simulations. Now, as I highlighted previously, those traditional Becker models are often limited to steady state conditions. And to demonstrate the impact of this, this single wheel test bed was used to apply a sinusoidal steering input to the tire, and the results are shown um, for SCM in blue on the right, and those traditional Becker models in orange. And while those two do follow the same overall trend, you do observe a quite large discrepancy, which results from the fact that those traditional Becker models do not account for those additional shear deformations that arise um, from that steering input. As such, a surrogate model to SCM is required. And to develop that surrogate model, a known... Yes. On the previous slide, um, what uh, gives confidence that SCM is more accurate than Becker? Are there any experimental results uh, to compare with? So there are some experimental re results. Um, if you look into the work out of 
DLR um, out in Germany. They do have some experimental validations for that. And also um, that NATO AVT248, which I mentioned a couple of slides ago, had a number of different tests um, that looked into the accuracy of different models. Okay, but it would be appropriate to have experimental results right here to make the statement that SEM is more accurate than Becker for this particular test that you are describing. Yeah, so in order to do this, you need this experiment, or in order to give that validation, um, you do need that experimental rig, which we don't have access to one of those. Um, so this is showing the accuracy of this model, and SEM has already been validated externally and independently. So we're treating that as a ground truth, as I mentioned in the introduction. Okay. Okay. Um, so to develop that surrogate model, a neural network was trained, um, as these have already demonstrated success in on-road applications, but they've not yet really been extended to this off-road deformable terrain. And to develop this neural network, an input space was compiled based on the tire states and the terrain parameters. Then light and hypercube sampling was used to determine 10,000 input samples, which were propagated through that soil contact model to generate the training data for the neural network. And for this work, the neural network was just a simple feed forward network with two hidden layers and a total of 14 neurons um, and hyperbolic tangent sigmoid transfer functions that do ensure twice continuous differentiability. And to demonstrate the accuracy of this neural network as compared to SEM, that same simulation was applied and the results are shown for the neural network in orange on the right and SCM in blue. And as we can see, much better agreement is observed, ultimately because it can better account for those shear deformations. And in addition to reducing that error um, as compared to those traditional Becker models, it actually runs 65 times faster. And not only can that neural network capture, capture the output of that single wheel test bed, but can actually be implemented on a vehicle and to show this, several simulations were ran where an M razor was commanded with sinusoidal steering and throttle commands on a clay SEM terrain. And it's worth noting that this particular simulation is completely different in both the vehicle states and the terrain properties than that uh, neural network training data. And hence, this gives us an independent test that we can use to assess the network's generalizability. The yeah, so question on the previous slide was, uh... The neural network trained with SEM data? The neural network is trained with SEM data, yes. The previous, on the previous slide. This? The next one, I'm sorry. Yeah. This? So wouldn't you yeah. expect the neural net to match with SEM on the second plot then? So this right here isn't actually part of the training data. This is another independent simulation. OK. All right. So this is something that hasn't seen before. But you do expect, what you see is that it matches much better, but of course it's not going to match it perfectly. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, the results of the simulation, as I started to mention, are shown in this figure on the right for the neural network in orange and for SEM in blue. And what you can observe here is that the neural network does capture this overall trend quite well, where the large majority of the errors are actually due to high frequency fluctuations in SEM, um, which aren't sufficiently captured in the input space of that neural network. And in addition, as I mentioned, um, this does maintain twice continuous differentiability, which is important for the optimization, which is gonna rely on Newton's method. And the C++ implementation has a peak computation time less than 100 microseconds, and is thus suitable for real-time implementation. As such, these results are promising, and we'll use this for our second question. Can a terrain estimator that utilizes this terra mechanics model determine terrain properties with sufficient accuracy for mobility prediction purposes? And in particular, I'm going to focus on estimating the sinkage exponent, as it's been shown to be the most sensitive parameter. However, this approach does hold for estimating multiple parameters, and I do have some backup slides with results if you're interested. To estimate that sinkage exponent, an unscented Coleman filter is going to be uh, utilized. Can I ask a clarifying a clarification sure. uh, on the previous slide? So, looking at this, is it fair to say uh, SEM was derived off of a Becker Wang model, and then your neural network model is derived off of an uh, SEM? So, in a sense, everything points back to the Becker Wang in some sense. Uh, so, the 
the underlying stresses, the equation for the stresses are based off becker long The difference is how you calculate that shear deformation. With those traditional becker long models, you assume- I get it, I, I, yes, I get it. I just only saying that everything, um, they are all improvements to the, uh, or one way or the other to uh, underlying becker long model in, in a sense. Yeah, so they're, they're extensions of your becker long models, yes. Okay, all right, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, so, here, as I was mentioning, um, we're gonna be using a UKF to estimate these terrain parameters. Um, and essentially the way this is gonna work is that we'll assume we have measurements of the vehicle's positions, its heading and its velocities. And those are gonna be fed into the unscented Kalman filter as measurements. Um, one key thing to note here is that there's no requirement being made on measuring those forces. Uh, then a three degrees of freedom bicycle model, which obtains its tire forces from that developed neural network that I just talked about, it's gonna be used to predict the vehicle state. The UKF then just takes that prediction, updates it with the error between our measurements and gives us an updated state vector where the last element is our terrain parameter. And this is commonly referred to as adaptive Kalman filtering. Now with that estimator in place, simulations were ran where an M razor operating on an SCM terrain is commanded with sinusoidal steering and throttle commands. And actually here, we're gonna look at two different simulations, one for a clay terrain and one for a sandy loam terrain. And it's worth noting that unlike techniques in the nature, there's no requirement made on the vehicle operating at low speed and it's certainly not operating with constant speed or steering as you'll find in the nature. Then once that simulation completed, some random Gaussian distributed noise was added to help simulate sensors. And these noise values are actually quite large and hence act in a worst case manner. That simulated sensor data was then run through the UKF and the results are shown for clay on the left and for that sandy loam terrain on the right. And in both of these figures, the true terrain parameter is shown as this red solid line, 10% error bounds are shown as these red dashed lines and the output of the estimator is shown in blue. And as we can see in both cases, this estimator does perform quite well. However, there is a slight error um, that can result from simplifications in that terra mechanics model, and also the fact that we're using a three degrees of freedom prediction model rather than that higher fidelity plant. Um, furthermore, you can actually get faster convergence than this if you increase the initial uncertainty in the estimate, but that tends to lead to a little bit more of a noisy estimate. And finally, um, the estimator does demonstrate the ability to run in real time with a peak computation time of just 0 0.25 milliseconds. And as I mentioned, you can use this approach to estimate multiple parameters, and I'd be happy uh, to show some results on that in the Q&A section. Now, while estimating that true terrain parameter is a worthy goal, it's actually of more interest to determine to what extent can we improve our prediction capabilities through terrain. Hey, James. Yep. Um, to, just, you don't need to go back, but earlier slide, you had the times compared. The C++ code was an automatic MATLAB translation or did you rewrite yourself? Uh, I rewrote it myself. Yes. Okay. All right, thanks. Yep. So um, to test kind of the utility of this in an MPC framework, um, we're gonna use that clay sinusoidal simulation. And this figure on the right is showing the results for a couple different models. In this figure, this blue solid line is the true noise-free states from Chrono. So that represents our plant. Then this red dash line is using a three degrees of freedom prediction model that's parameterized with that converged estimate. And this black dotted line is using a bicycle model that's parameterized with our initial guess. Those models are then used to predict the vehicle response 2.5 seconds into the future, after which the states are reset to their true values from chrono. And that process is essentially repeated. And the key thing to notice here is that by using that estimate, we do indeed much better replicate that plant response, which ultimately comes from the fact that by better knowing the terrain parameter, we can better predict those lateral forces and hence um, reduce our error in our predictions. Hey, James. Yes. Yep. Uh, on, on that slide, earlier slide, maybe that may be a better slide for me to ask. Uh, I'm always puzzled with this uh, finding that um, N seems to be the only parameter that matters. While I would have expected KC and KFE are really related to the soil. 
um, different types of soil have a different uh, influence on the two different parameters. So can you think of anything that is in the MPC that could be um, biasing towards this um, uh, conclusion? I mean, uh, overall it could be fitting well, and uh, but is it really realistic uh, or something uh, not coming out uh, in, in realistic values? So I think there's a couple of points of, um, that we need to clarify here. Um, first, right here, we're not actually using MPC. This is just, we're sim this is purely based on simulation and we are giving the inputs to this people. We're not using MPC in any way. And it's not that this is the only parameter that matters, it's that this is the most sensitive parameter. So this is the parameter that matters the most. Some of the other parameters will have an impact. And that's where that, if you remember in my dissertation, where that identification study comes in, but those aren't as sensitive. So they don't matter as much as this particular parameter, but they do have some impact. And actually um, the next most sensitive parameter is gonna be that K fee. But that KC that you're talking about, you don't actually need to estimate and you can't estimate it if you're estimating KV because it's not identifiable. Um, is that so clarify? You, so you are, um, okay, so you're using the bicycle model just as, okay, with our MPC, but it is a bicycle model that you are using for the clear mechanics uh, mm -hmm. interface. Yeah, There's, yep. So this is only just showing the predictions. Um, there's no, no MPC going on here yet. We'll get to that in a couple of slides. Okay. Okay. Um, so in addition to that simulation-based validation that I just showed, experimental validation was also performed by subjecting an actual M razor to a series of figure eight maneuvers on an open wet grass field. And for this test site, we don't actually know the true terrain parameters. So we're gonna assess the utility of this terrain estimator by looking at how it can be used to reduce our prediction error in our prediction model. Therefore, this top plot is showing the normalized sum squared error, um, where this is generated by comparing the measurements to the VPO model predictions over this entire experiment. And what's being done here is that bicycle model is being parameterized with various values for that sinkage exponent, um, where this range from 0 0.26 to 0 0.7 is what you'll find for grass in the literature. And as we can see, that prediction error is minimized at a value of about 0 0.39. Then if you look at the output of the estimator shown in this bottom plot in blue, we do indeed observe that it converges quite close to the optimal value, hence giving us confidence in this estimator's ability on a physical vehicle. Therefore, while we don't actually know the true terrain parameters of this test site, we do see that the estimator is minimizing our prediction error, which is the ultimate goal in an MPC setting. And furthermore, that value that's converging to is within the range of what you'll expect for grass in the literature. Now with the estimator improving the prediction fidelity, it can be combined with MPC to answer our third research question. To what extent can such terrain estimation improve the safety and robustness of autonomous vehicles on uncertain deformable terrains? And to answer this, this work is gonna develop a single level adaptive nonlinear MPC algorithm. And in this work, the cost is selected to help minimize the time to goal. There's also a cost that's um, helping in that ensure that we're aligned with our terminal heading. And there's a penalty on our control effort and our deviation from the terminal state. The vehicle predictions are gonna be given by a three degrees of freedom bicycle model, as that's been shown to be of suitable fidelity and efficiency for short-term predictions. Then constraints are imposed on the vehicle states and its controls that are consistent with the vehicle's capabilities. And finally, these remaining constraints represent the terminal state constraint and the obstacle avoidance constraint. This is then encoded into MPC, which takes the traditional form of finding a control profile that minimizes a cost subject to some constraints. And very briefly, um, essentially a control profile that seeks to minimize that cost is sent to a R prediction model, which predicts the vehicle states a short duration into the future. Based upon those, the constraints and costs are evaluated if it's not feasible and optimal, that process is repeated. But if it is feasible and optimal, that control profile is sent to the plant to be executed and measurements are used to reinitialize the next iteration of MPC. 
And the key takeaway from this slide is that due to this dependency on these vehicle predictions, it's important that MPC is made aware of how these terrain conditions are impacting the vehicle response. Therefore, an additional layer is added into this MPC formulation. And in particular, those measurements are also sent to the terrain estimator, which outputs an estimate of that terrain parameter that's used to parameterize the bicycle model at the initialization of the next MPC iteration. Hence, this is gonna allow for MPC to learn and adapt to these terrain conditions online to yield better informed control. And to assess the utility of the neural network and terrain estimator in this MPC framework, we're gonna look at three cases today. The first case, or the first two cases are gonna highlight the importance of deformable terrain terra mechanics modeling in comparison to a Pacheco model in both a simple and a severe maneuver. Whereas the third case is gonna highlight the improvement achievable through terrain adaptation in 27 simulations to obtain statistically significant results. Other than that, these formulations are all gonna be kept the exact same and there's gonna be no tuning performed for any of these individual algorithms. In this first case, um, there's gonna be two runs for this simulation. In this plot, I'm showing those two runs um, where PMPC shown as this orange dashed line is gonna be using a Pajeka tire model um, to predict those forces and shown in blue is NNMPC, which is gonna be using that developed neural network that I talked about previously for those uh, force predictions. And in this simulation, the plant has 11 degrees of freedom and is operating on a clay SCM terrain. Now, as we can see in this top plot, both of these controllers are able to complete this maneuver. However, we do observe a slightly different path. And in particular, this NNMPC steers in avoidance of obstacle earlier and actually counter steers back towards the center line prior to passing this obstacle, which helps it be better aligned with the terminal goal states. On the other hand, PMPC turns a little bit later in the maneuver and continues to drift past this obstacle. And the reason for that is that this Pajeka tire model actually predicts larger forces than is achievable by the plant, which leads to less drastic steering commands. And that degraded accuracy leads to degraded performance in the terminal heading error, the terminal Y position error, and in the deviation from the center line. And in addition to that, another thing that we can observe is that this NNMPC gives much smoother steering commands than that PMPC. And that's ultimately because the improved fidelity from that neural network model allows us to better predict the plant state at the end of the execution horizon, and hence requires less correction at the next MPC iteration. What kind of terrain is that going over? This is a clay SCM terrain. Would you expect Pacheca to be a, a, a proper model to use? So that's what this is highlighting is that this, you do need to account for this terrain deformability. Ultimately, that's what this is slides highlighting. Pacheca models have actually been parameterized for these off-road domains um, a little bit. However, we didn't actually perform that parameterization um, because we don't have access to the facilities to do that. So here we're taking just a traditional Pacheca project model and showing that you do need to account for terrain deformability. So it may not be... Uh, so like one way you can think about this is that these project models with MPC, that's your current state of the art. That's what you'll see a lot in the literature. Yeah, not for off-road, I would say. It is essentially for... For, unstru off for unstructured environments, you do see this type of model quite a bit. Um, I'm not so sure, okay. Okay, so in the second scenario, um, we're gonna highlight that this discrepancy can actually become safety critical. And for this, the vehicle is gonna be forced through a narrow corridor that requires a high prediction fidelity. Um, <clears throat> and as we can see in this figure, and an MPC turns in avoidance of these obstacles earlier than PMPC. And the reason for that, again, is that that projected tire model actually predicts larger forces than the plant can achieve, which leads to less drastic steering commands or less drastic steering commands shown down here in higher speeds that ultimately create enough discrepancy that the vehicle ends up colliding with that obstacle. Um, finally, the computational effort of this algorithm is on the order of 10 Hertz, thus demonstrating the potential for real-time implementation. Now, to test the terrain adaptation of that third case, 27 simulations are run on a clay SCM terrain to yield statistically significant results. And here, Latin hypercube sampling was used to determine the obstacle's positions, their radii, 
in the initial guess for the sinkage exponent. And for this scenario, there's going to be two simulations for each of those 27 runs. In one simulation, there's going to be no estimation taking place, and we're going to parameterize our bicycle model with that initial guess. Whereas in the second simulation, we'll parameterize our bicycle model with that initial guess. But as the simulation runs, that UKF is going to be running in parallel and it's going to be improving on the estimate. Hey James. Yes. So um, this is the this is the same clay uh, terrain, right? What was that? And this is uh, uh, clay terrain, the same thing that you had uh, Pacheco model before. Am I right? Yes. This one is a clay terrain that I'll be showing. Um, so uh, here also you find. Uh, uh, n being the uh, the sinkage expo exponent being the most significant. Um, what was the uh, uh, contribution of Kc, which is essential for cohesive soils? I mean, between Kc and Kφ, what kind of sensitivities did you find? Uh, Kφ still being the most in, uh, more sensitive than Kc. So that's kind of that's a challenging question because those two are added together in this model. You can't actually estimate those two. They have the same effect. Right, yeah, but, uh, the way these models work is it's k phi plus kc over b, and b is fixed at the terrain width. So you're just adding two parameters together. Right. So I, I guess those if you reduce right. to one, uh, I mean, if you are able to separate them, I would have expected c being more uh, dominant than phi in a clay. So, uh, but even if you add them, um, let's say uh, k phi is zero, still kc is. Uh, there. So I guess my expectation would have been KC would still be competing uh, if not even more than N uh, or could be more. So, so I think coming back to my question earlier, within MPC or even otherwise, you are using a bicycle model to go with, uh, uh, with, with the SEM uh, or, or the neural net derived from the SEM. Am I right? So if that's the case, is, so it, is the model one. something, uh, vehicle model, uh, bicycle model have something to do with the uh, finding on the uh, sinkage being exponent being the most dominant uh, parameter? It does not. So those sensitivity analysis, the one I showed here, it actually wasn't even performed by us. That sensitivity analysis was performed by the DLR and all that it looked into was the soil contact model. There is no vehicle model in that. That's showing the sensitivity of the soil contact model to the parameters. Okay, so the uh, the conclusion on or uh, um, the uh, sinkage ex exponent is the only thing that matters much is coming from a DLR, not from your work then. So we have also performed a sensitivity analysis earlier, like at the very start of this, and we did confirm those results. But again, we're not saying that it's the only parameter that matters, it's the most sensitive parameter. Okay. Okay, um, so as I was mentioning here, there's 27 simulations run. Um, there's gonna be, one is gonna use terrain estimation, the other one is not. Um, however, both of those two are going to be using the neural network terror mechanics model. And as such, the results of this third scenario are gonna demonstrate the utility of terrain estimation. And these figures are showing one of those 27 runs. And as we can see, um, both UK FMP IG MPC, which only uses our initial guess, um, they're both able to complete this maneuver where the UKF is shown in blue and IG MPC is shown as this orange dash line. But one of the things that we do notice is that it does steer um, back towards that center line more when we use that adaptive algorithm. And also it minimizes our error on our terminal state constraints better. Um, this bottom plot is showing the output of the unscented column filter which does indeed converge to that true terrain parameter. And furthermore, um, if you look into the steering commands, one of the things that we do see is more drastic steering commands by using that adaptive formulation. And in addition, those steering commands actually tend to be smoother um, because by better knowing that terrain parameter, we can better predict these um, forces which require less correction at that next NPC iteration. In terms of the performance metrics over all of those 27 simulations, there's actually no noticeable difference between the two algorithms in terms of the solve time and time to goal. However, we do have statistically significant results in the remaining metrics, 
And in particular, we see a reduction in the deviation from the center line and the terminal Y position error by using the adaptive formulation. However, we actually incur more steering effort by using that adaptive formulation. And that's ultimately because um, that's the trade-off of better tracking that center line. Now, while that adaptive MPC does appear to um, improve our performance, additional robustness can be achieved through utilizing the estimate in that uncertainty in the planning phase. And to address this, a new MPC variant called uncertainty-based contingent model predictive control was developed in this dissertation. And the general format of this is the same as adaptive MPC, but now the terrain estimator is going to supply the standard deviation in addition to the mean to MPC. And MPC is then going to use two prediction models. So one model is parameters at the upper bound. So that will be the mean plus the standard deviation. And the second model is parameters at the lower bound. So that's the mean minus the standard deviation. And those two models are then both going to be used to predict the states. And the cost and constraints are going to be evaluated for both of those models. Another key difference in this formulation is that there's now two control profiles that are generated, one for that upper bound and one for that lower bound. And those two control profiles are free to vary independently, but the first move is gonna cons be constrained to be equal because that's the move that's actually sent to the plant to be executed. Hence, what this ensures is that there's a feasible action at the bounds of these estimate. And to highlight the utility of this, um, a double lane change was performed, and the results are shown in these figures for contingent MPC in blue and the baseline adaptive algorithm as this orange dashed line. Um, the key takeaway here is that because contingent MPC has to account for those two models, it acts in a more conservative manner and commands a much less drastic speed. Um, and in addition, the computation time for contingent MPC is 5 hertz while that for adaptive MPC is around 10 hertz. So they both do have the potential for real-time application, but contingent MPC is more computationally expensive. And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, um, this top video is showing the simulation um, for contingent MPC. And hopefully this goes through okay over Zoom, but what you'll see is that it does indeed avoid both of these obstacles. Um, and in addition, adaptive MPC is gonna be able to do that, but as Hopefully you can see it's gonna be doing it at a higher speed, although over Zoom, I'm guessing the video probably won't go through too well, um, but you do see that that also does complete this maneuver. Um, now, while both of those algorithms can complete this maneuver, in a more severe maneuver, the robustness of that uncertainty-based contingent MPC can actually become safety critical. And to highlight this, I wanna turn our attention to an on-road collision and imminent steering scenario. And in this scenario, the host vehicle shown in red is traveling at 35 meters per second when it detects a stopped vehicle just 55 meters ahead. And due to that close proximity, there's insufficient time for this vehicle to break to avoid collision. And the only action it can take is to perform an evasive lane change. <clears throat> and in this scenario, MPC is actually gonna believe the coefficient of friction is higher than what the host vehicle is actually driving on. And we're gonna be trying to use that uncentered column filter to learn that estimate. And the results for three of the different algorithm, algorithms that I discussed today are shown in these three figures. What's happening in these figures is that the true value of the coefficient of friction that the plant is driving on or that the plant sees is given on the x-axis, whereas what the MPC algorithm is initialized with is given on the y-axis. And for reference, this diagonal line would be an exact match between the two. So these off-diagonal mismatches occur, um, and essentially what happens is MPC thinks the coefficient of friction is higher, so it's going to command less drastic inputs. Um, <clears throat> and for this, actually, anything to the left of this red solid line is infeasible even under exact parameterization just due to the severity of this maneuver. And what we can see here is that there is a narrow band of success shown in green for the non-adaptive MPC algorithm where there's no estimation. However, if you use the UKF to learn that estimate, we can significantly expand that success region. Then if you use contingent MBC to also account for the uncertainty, you can further expand that to cover the majority of the feasible operating range. Therefore, these results demonstrate the ability of the neural network and the uncentered Kalman filter 
to improve our performance and safety of these MPC planners. And in summary, today we've demonstrated an optimal control oriented Terra mechanics model that achieves fast, differentiable, and dynamic operation through neural networks. This is then utilized by an unscented Kalman filter um, for prediction oriented estimation of these terrain parameters. And those two are then combined with the vehicle dynamics um, to achieve terrain adaptive MPC to improve the navigation and or performance and safety. And while this work has addressed many of the limitations to make these off-road autonomous ground vehicles possible, there are still important future avenues that can be addressed. For example, not only do we need to account for terrain deformability, but 3D terrains can also be encountered. And looking into things like how the load is being transferred in the vehicle, or how um, the slip is being affected and how these sloped terrains might affect the traversability of these regions should also be explored. And in addition, we have performed some experimental validation. Um, one of our tests is shown in this figure right here, but exploring these algorithms on more terrains in a more diverse set of conditions is also of interest. And additionally, these algorithms can be combined with a um, full autonomy stack and a lot of things can be looked at. For example, with the perception module, you can then perform terrain classification and use that to have a varying um, terrain parameter over the prediction horizon of MPC based on that classification, classification algorithm. And in addition, in military settings, another important thing to look at is shared control. And this is important um, because it can allow for drivers to refocus their attention on secondary tests such as threat surveillance and monitoring. And in particular, it can help reduce things like cognitive overload and the or the algorithms developed in this dissertation can provide the base autonomy for that. In summary, um, this presentation today has highlighted the following original contributions. Um, the development of an efficient, dynamic, and twice continuously differentiable, deformable terrain terra mechanics model. Development of a terrain estimation algorithm capable of real-time performance. Development of a single level terrain adaptive trajectory planning and tracking algorithm for off-road autonomous vehicles operating on deformable terrains. And the development of uncertainty-based contingent MPC, which is a novel, selectively robust MPC formulation to increase the robustness to terrain estimate uncertainty. And if you are interested, there is much more information in detail in my dissertation that I wasn't able to cover in the interest of time or you can look into the numerous publications that are already available in the literature. And finally, um, the algorithms that were developed in this dissertation have already been transitioned um, to a couple of people. Um, so the US Army Ground Vehicle Systems Center, it's been implemented in simulation environments and on a Polaris and Razor experimental vehicle, and it will be transitioned to NATO ABT 341. And in addition, on-road versions of these algorithms have been transitioned to the Toyota Research Institute. And there's a patent pending uh, related to a lot of this. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have also performed some experimental validation that I didn't cover in the interest of time. And I do have backup slides if you're interested. But just to show you a quick video of what this looks like, um, this is going to be showing it um, one of the tests we did on campus. And here, you won't see any of the obstacles, but MPC thinks that there's two obstacles there, and you will see it steering in avoidance of these. Um, so I'll let this video play so you can see this really quick. So right now, you'll start to see it steering in avoidance of the first obstacle, and then there's going to be a second obstacle that it steers in avoidance of, but there's no perception on this vehicle, um, so it can't actually see them. We just had to tell MPC that those were there. Um, finally, I want to acknowledge my committee, um, Tolga, Jeff, Jay, Gabor, and Demetra, who have all been critical in helping me develop as a researcher and providing me with the foundation and knowledge necessary to perform this research. And I also wanna thank my lab mates, both past and present, um, and my family for all of their help and patience and support. And lastly, I want to acknowledge the Automotive Research Center, the J. Robert Baster Computational Innovation Fellowship Program, and the Toyota Research Institute, who have provided funds and support to make this research possible. And this concludes my talk. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And I will hand it back over to Tolga um, to chair that.